And it turns out that we have built into us biases and heuristics. All right? And I'll define each of those for you now. So a bias is a systematic distortion, something that's going to lead you to suboptimal decision making. And these are things that intrude in the way that we make our decisions. I want to contrast those with heuristics. One of the things that we do over time is remember we talked about procedural memory, procedural ways of doing things. That leads us to kind of shortcuts, right? So when there's a complex task to be done in the environment, sometimes we develop rules of thumb, things that we do that work pretty well most of the time. We may not follow step by step all of the instructions we're supposed to follow, but, but because time is short or because we're overloaded, this is something that seems to be good enough in most circumstances. So a heuristic is not a bias. It's not a systematic distortion. It's just a way that we use to do a shortcut, right? And it usually is functional, but we'll see that sometimes those heuristics lead us into down the garden path, all right? So I want to talk now about a set of specific biases. Uh, there are lots and lots and lots of biases. If you look up cognitive psychology and biases, you'll get strings and strings of them. So I'm just going to talk about a few of them to give you a flavor for some of the things that influence us when we're not necessarily aware of it. So specifically, I'll talk about these five, fixation and anchoring, confirmation, salience, availability, overconfidence and framing, and the related bias of sunk cost. All right, so I'm going to start with a story. Imagine that you wake up in the middle of the night and you have a headache. So you go to your cabinet in the bathroom, you take out a bottle of pills, you take two pills, you go back to sleep. You wake up in the morning and you realize to your horror, uh-oh, I had two bottles of aspirin in there. I had a bottle of poison in there. <laughs> and they're all the same shape. And I didn't listen to my little, you know, speaking pill bottle, so I don't know which one I took. All right, so a priori three bottles, two of them are aspirin, one of them is poison. The likelihood that you took the poison is one-third, the likelihood that you took the aspirin is two-thirds. Now, I'm not feeling so hot, <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, why am I sick? And I think, okay, if I took the poison, it's 80% likely that I would have gotten sick. If I took the aspirin, it's only 5% probable that I get sick. So the likelihood of getting symptoms from the aspirin is 5%. The likelihood from the poison is 80%. So the question is, now that you have symptoms, you're not feeling so hot, what's the likelihood that you took the poison? 33%. 33%? I heard 50% somewhere. Anybody else want to guess? All right, we've got numbers all over the place. All right, well, let's think about it. How could you have ended up with symptoms? What are the ways in which you could have gotten sick, right? One of the ways is that you took the aspirin and you got sick. And if we do the probabilities, the likelihood of getting sick from the aspirin was only 5%, even though the likelihood of taking the aspirin was 2 thirds or 67%. So if we do the actual math, which I know you're not doing in your head, 5% times 67% is 3%. Okay, 3% likelihood that you would get sick, okay? On the other hand, if you took the poison and you got sick, the likelihood of getting sick from the poison is 80%. The likelihood of taking the poison is only 33%, but that is 26%, all right? So now, if you think about the total number of ways in which you could have had the symptoms, you could have either taken the aspirin and gotten sick, which is 3% roughly, or you could have taken the poison and gotten sick, which is 26% likely. So if you know you got sick, right, if you know that you got sick, the likelihood that it came from the poison is 88.7% or almost 89%, right? That is the 0.264 is the likelihood that you took the poison and got sick over the total ways you could have gotten sick, which is either by taking the aspirin or by taking the poison. So now that you know that you had symptoms, right, the likelihood has increased dramatically that you took the poison, right? And in fact, this is something called Bayes' theorem. That's the math 
Um, and there'll be a handout that I'll give you at the end that has this math on it so you can check my math. But believe me, this is correct. The likelihood of taking, having taken the poison has increased dramatically because you have symptoms and because it's so unlikely that you would have gotten sick had you taken the aspirin. So this demonstrates the fixation or anchoring bias. That is, we tend to kind of fixate. We get fixed, right? The likelihood ahead of time was one third. So we think, well, it's still one third. But we have new information. That new information is that we're now sick. And we don't use that information to adjust sufficiently. We've kind of anchored ourselves in that one third probability. And we don't adjust upwards sufficiently, okay? Now, this is a particularly a problem if you are getting a display that gives you updates of information, right? So you've made a diagnosis of situation, and now you get an update, and another update, and another update. You need to recognize that people are not always updating sufficiently because that first piece of information in is going to create that anchor. Okay. I want to talk fairly briefly about a very complicated model that Chris Wickens, um, Keller, and Shaw have um, put together to talk about how we go about making decisions. It has a lot of probabilities and things in it, and it's not, I'm not interested so much in getting you to understand every little nuance of the model. What I do want you to understand is that it's based on this notion that we have, we're processing information, right? So there's basically three stages. There's Q sampling, which is just the piece of the information model we talked about yesterday, where you're taking information in from the world, right? There's then the situation assessment, the comprehension piece. There's then the decision choice, right? Making a choice about what action to take. And then each of those decisions you, that you could make have consequences, shooting down the plane, not shooting down the plane. And that leads to some outcome. Now, the outcome is gonna depend on the actual state of the world, right? So, if the state of the world is that it is a hostile threat, there'll be one you know, outcome. If it's not hostile, there's another one. So let me talk about this in a particular example, which will make it clearer. Imagine you're a mountain climber, and you're up on the mountain, and you start, and in the middle of the day, we have these cues that are out there. We have the weather forecast, right? We all know to look at the forecast to see what the weather's going to be like. We have the current skies, and we have some feeling in our toes, or lack of feeling in our toes, because it's cold. And we're sitting there with some assessment about whether the weather is going to get worse or whether it's going to stay as good as it currently is. So you're on the mountain, you have some weather going, and you have this choice between whether the weather's going to worsen or stay, stay good. Now you have a choice. Should you continue climbing or should you go back? Right? Now, if you decide to continue, there are two things that might happen. You could reach the summit, and you might get frostbite. Okay? If you decide to turn back, you certainly are not going to summit. You're not going to make it to the top. You might still get frostbite. Okay? And that's all going to be a function of what actually happens with the weather. So we start with our uh, forecast. We have our choices here. We continue to go back, and we have these options. Now, if the weather worsens, the likelihood that you summit is going to change, right? So if the weather gets worse, there's a smaller probability than if the weather stays good that you're going to make it to the top, right? So notice that even if the weather is really good, you may or may not actually make it to the summit, right? Because there are other factors that influence this. But this is going to be the probability that you actually reach the summit this here is going to be the value that you attach to summiting, right? So it's a really positive, 10 is a, it's a positive value. You want to, to get to the summit. You can do the same thing for frostbite. So if you continue on, you don't like getting frostbite in any case, right? <laughs> Not a very pleasant thing, so negative 5. And if you continue on and the weather gets worse, there's a higher probability of you getting frostbite than if the weather, um, and if you go, than if you go back. And over here, the likelihood is less that you'll get frostbite if the weather stays good. Right? Does that make sense? Are we yes. 
Yes, I've made them up. I mean, we don't know what they really are. But, and in fact, people don't really know them either, right? On a scale of one. On a scale of, of, of one, right, one to ten. So the idea is, you know, it, it, there's much more positive value associated with making it to the summit than turning back and not summiting if you're going to die, right? <laughs> so you have this choice here. Uh, and, and here's the probability of one. We know for sure, right? If you turn back, you're not going to make it to the summit. So you don't need a lot of probability to know that it's negative that if you don't make it, and you're certainly not going to make it if you turn around. On the other hand, you're just kind of guessing. We're not saying that these numbers really exist in your head, because remember, we don't really believe people are good at probability. But you have these feelings, right? You have this notion that you know for sure that it's more likely you're going to get frostbite if you continue and if the weather gets worse. So you may not know the exact amount, and you're going to rely on your guide to tell you some information because they may have more experience. And where that comes from is not clear. The bigger point here is that this is the information processing piece of making the decision. But now there are other factors that go into the decision you make. But there are other things that matter, right? So motivation, prestige, you know, what's going to happen if you go home <laughs> and you didn't make it? Are you going to feel bad? Um, what your wife going to say if you didn't turn around, well, if, if you didn't turn around, you get killed. You're not going to know what your wife had to say, but you might have a pretty good idea. Um, <laughs> all right. And then there are other things that are going to influence this, which is how confident are you in your, in your climbing skills, right? How much do you know about the weather personally? How much do you trust the information that you have? So what Chris was trying to do, Chris Wickens, in putting this model together was trying to take what we know about the information processing structure and other factors that influence decisions. So as you think about supporting decision making, you want to be thinking about all these different features that play a role in decision making. All right. All right. So you can use display technology to help support the decision making process. So if you know that certain cues are likely to be less perceived, you can either make them all equally perceptually available, or you can make the more diagnostic cues more salient, right? You can actually make them pop out in some way. You can also rely on training. Now, training is not the most effective way to account for human you know, failures, right? So, um, but training can help. You can give, give people debiasing knowledge. So just say, when you're doing this task, you are likely to have this pop up inappropriately. So just know that that's going to happen. You can also give them instructions whenever you're thinking about two alternatives. Really play the devil's advocate. Really flip it and think about the other side of the coin. So even though your nature might be to think about one side, you can give them instructions to always try to balance that. And then finally, you can use some automated system that gives you predictions about which thing might be the best action to take. Now, in that case, you actually can support decision making, but you also have to worry about, unfortunately, at least in this country, legal issues, right? So if the automation makes the decision and you do what the automation says, who's ultimately responsible if something goes wrong? So uh, <laughs> just something to think about.